Hey guys, what's up? It's Pastor Corey. I'm the youth and worship pastor here at Cornerstone Church in Conroe, Texas. We are so happy. However you got this link to this video, whether you were referred to by a friend or you just strolled across, I'm so excited that you're watching. We believe that God's going to speak to you today. A couple things that you need to know. Make sure you get plugged into a Cornerstone table. This is where our primary means of ministry is going to be. Uh, we, of course, believe in the four walls of the church, but we also believe that biblical ministry is also done around a table in a home. So make sure you get plugged in, um, share what God is doing in your life. Uh, and, and I believe that as we do that, we will grow in our spiritual walk with the Lord as well. Also, we're starting something new called Encounter Night. It's going to be where the first Wednesday of every month, every ministry is going to join in the main sanctuary for a time of prayer and worship and a devotion. We're also going to feed you before. So if you like free food, make sure you show up as well. God bless you. Enjoy the message. And I hope you have a good week. Uh, well, I want to get back into our teaching where we've been uh, throughout this month, this teaching series that we're calling Roots of Redemption. Um, and I, I know some have been uh, a, a little amazed by this, but we're just spending this whole month in Genesis chapter 3, uh, looking at the same story, uh, that first story there of creation and of man and woman. Uh, they're at the very beginning of the book of Genesis, specifically Genesis chapter 3, and we'll be there again today, and uh, we'll continue there throughout the remainder of the week. Uh, if you've missed any of those, the first message was on the false promises of 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 Satan, the lies of Satan, how he loves to uh, tempt us with things that we know we ought not to do, but has a way of presenting them uh, that appear to be pleasing to us. But we know that that those lies are only lies if we fall victim to them that bring shame, guilt uh, into our lives. But I'm so thankful that God has come to restore that, to save us uh, from that. Last week, we talked about the tree. We spent a whole Sunday morning talking about that particular tree of the knowledge of, of good and evil. And, and can I share this as just a side thought? I've shared this with a couple gatherings uh, this, this past week. We, we know the garden was good. The garden was, was created of God. The garden was blessed of God. And the garden wasn't necessarily a small garden. It was a pretty good size garden. And I, I don't want you to lose sight. There's only one thing that they were told not to, to eat of. That was just that that one tree. But here was the thought that I shared uh, in multiple settings this past week. I, I believe that there were a lot of pathways in that garden. I, I mean, even in small gardens, there's a lot of pathways, right? So I would think in this garden, there were probably a lot of pathways. What, what if Eve didn't walk down the path that would have led to that tree? Proverbs 5 teaches us about that along with other portions in regards to another thought, specifically in regards to the adulterous woman. The Bible says don't just not go to her house. It actually says don't go down the pathway that leads to her house. May, may we be careful where we go, where, where we go. Let, let's, not, let's not try to get to the so close to the edge that we're, we're trying to tempt to see how far can I go before I fall off this edge. Uh, ideally, just stay away from the edge. Don't go down the pathway, right? Well, what would have happened if Eve didn't walk down the path that would have led to that tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? But you can go back. You can find all of those online at our church app or our church website, Cornerstone. Uh, Conroe.org. We're going to go back to Genesis chapter 3. I've entitled this morning's message, Why Eve? Read along with me, picking up in the first verse. It reads, the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Verse 2, of course, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it, for if you do, you will die. Verse 4, you won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and 
ate it. Then she gave, gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Verse 7, at that moment, their eyes were open, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Father, we thank you today for your word. Lord, I, I know that your word will accomplish what you've purposed for it to accomplish. God, but I also pray that our heart is responsive, Lord, to your word. And that we respond well to your truth today, Lord, believing that your will would be done. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. At the beginning formations of our country, uh, there's a story of a young man who was uh, going on a journey. And as part of this journey to this new area, he had to cross over this particular river. And as he was crossing over this river, there were five horsemen that were galloping toward him and stopped right where he was at. And the first of the five aggressively approached him and questioned what he was doing and where he was going. And he tries to calmly to respond to this guy and explain to him that he's on this journey and begin to tell them about where he was trying to get to. And, and there was what we would say was a little standoff between this young gentleman journeying across this new land and these five horsemen. And as, as they're looking at one another, the young gentleman walks past the first guy, walks past the second guy and stops at the third, the middle one, and kindly asks him, hey, would you mind if I get on the back of the horse with you? to cross the river. And the third horseman agreed, let him up, and he crossed the river on the back of the horse. And the story goes on to tell us that he continued a good ways along with them on the journey on the back of the horse until they got to a particular area where he was going this way and the five horsemen were going that way. And as he jumped off the back of the horse, the lead horseman, the guy that was very aggress aggressive, quietly walks over to the young gentleman and simply asks, why, why, why did you ask the third guy, the guy in the middle? And the young gentleman just quietly responds back to him. Because when I looked at his face, he looked like he cared. Only one of the five looked like they cared about this young gentleman. One kind face among the five. I share this story with us because each one of us, just like these five horsemen, we communicate in nonverbal ways every day. In essence, what I want you to hear is we send off signals or we give out signals every day. Not, not so much in what I say, but in what I do and how I look. I, I wonder, as we look back to Genesis 3, what signals was Eve sending? that the serpent thought, let's go after her. Let's talk to her. Because there's only two, right? There's Eve, and there's also Adam. I wonder what signals Eve was giving that, that she would be the one who would be questions. Why, why did the enemy use her for, for his attack? Why, why didn't he begin with Adam? What, what signals, once again, what, was the woman giving that the man was not giving? Now I want to look at this 
and just expound on this for just a few moments. I just, moments. I have just three thoughts for you. Let's begin with Eve's encounter with the serpents. Because here in the very first verse, if we look back at this, right, right in the middle, it says, one day he, referring to the serpent, asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? And Eve, appropriately, to the best of her ability, corrects the serpent in verse 2. Of course, we may eat fruit. From the trees in the garden, the woman replied, it's only the fruit from the tree of, in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. She continues, God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. Now, as we, we look at this, and we've looked at this story now three weeks in a row, I, I believe we have to understand the, the order, the sequence that this story takes place because just as that's important in our lives, I believe it's in, important in this life. Turn back a chapter with me to the to the second chapter, Genesis chapter 2. Here's the actual commands. The Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and to watch over it, verse 16. But the Lord God warned, warned him, you, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit... He says, you will surely die. And then continue with me. Skip down a few verses. To the 21st verse, it reads, So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. Here's what I want you to see. God gave the command to Adam before Eve was even created. So how did Eve possibly get the command? I would submit to you probably from her husband, who she lived with, who she walked with, I believe Adam was probably a good husband and related the message of God to his wife. So, so Eve, Eve learning of this, she knew that the tree in the center of the garden was, was not good. She, she knew that it was not right for her, right for them to eat from the tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, and so she, she corrects the serpents. But hear me, the, the serpent is persistent, right? The, the serpent's not just going to give up just because we rebuke him. I, I know we love, and I'm not discounting this passage. I, I know we love to quote that passage, that, that passage of Scripture we find in the, in the book of James. James 4, verse 6. Some of you know it. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. But that does not mean that he may not come back. Because the enemy is very persistent. So he comes back at Eve again. He's not going to be satisfied with just one rebuke. So he presses Eve a little bit more. This time, in the second questioning, he does what I would say is begins to attack the character of God. And with this, Eve succumbs, grabs a hold of the fruit, and bites it. Still the question, why Eve? Why Eve? Perhaps it was precisely because she only had second-hand knowledge about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Adam was the one that lived, we would say, with that firsthand experience. Our best thought is that Adam passed that along to Eve, the command that God gave. And I believe that alone would probably have made 
Eve an easier target than Adam was going to be. So with all of his subtlety, the serpent went after the one who had to rely on the words of another rather than the one who had personally lived out that experience with God. Leads me to my second thought for us. We all long for firsthand experiences. Today, many of us, many of us, we desire to have that firsthand experience. I'm not saying that Eve didn't walk with God just like Adam walked with God because we know the scripture identifies that they both walked with God in the garden. What I'm identifying is what we know in Scripture, that that God gave the command to Adam. More than likely, Adam passed the command on to Eve. How how would I identify that? Scripture is going to help us with this because that's very that practice is very common in Scripture, as well as that practice is still very common in our world today. But the reality is we long, every single one of us probably long for that audible voice to speak out of the clouds of heaven right to our life. Do we not? We all long for that that bright light Damascus road experience like the Apostle Paul had, that that when I know when I encounter God, that, that it was so bright that my eyes were blinded. I know we don't say that, but that's what we want. We seek the first hand. If I can narrow it to this, we seek the kind of experience that we believe would drive away all the lingering doubts in our life. But I would submit to you those miraculous experiences don't always drive away the lingering doubts. How, How do I know? Go back to the scripture I just read to you this morning that great experience that the children of Israel had there at Marah, right? And if you know the stories, just before this experience, they had that great Red Sea experience where God sent this wind because the Egyptian army is coming after them, fixing to invade them. They they all believe that they're fixing to die, and God miraculously parts the waters in two. And they don't just walk across muddy land. The Bible identifies that they walk across dry land. And as they get to the end and Moses gets to the other side, all of a sudden God miraculously brings all the water back together and they literally sit there and watch all of the Egyptians drown in the Red Sea. I mean, I don't know. I think if I had that experience, I would never complain again in my life. I would never doubt again. But you go one chapter later. Moses, why did you bring us out here? This water is terrible. You would think something would click in somebody's mind. Man, we just saw God part all the waters. Surely God could do something with this little pond. No, they just start griping and complaining. But really, church, we we seek the kind of experience, that miraculous firsthand experience that for whatever reason we believe will drive away all the lingering doubts, but I want you to realize more often than not, the miraculous does not satisfy. The miraculous does not satisfy. I, I want to show you this in a couple of portions of Scripture. I apologize. I didn't give this to our team, so these aren't going to be behind me. But I want, I want you to see this. Turn with me to Luke 16. Luke 16. I'm going to pick up in the 19th verse this morning. Jesus, this is just a parable. Jesus said, there was a certain rich man who was splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen and who lived each day in luxury. At his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. Verse 21, as Lazarus lay there longing for scraps from the rich man's table, the dogs would come and lick his open sores. Verse 22, I know that doesn't sound pretty. Finally, the poor man died and was carried by the angel to sit beside Abraham at the heavenly banquets. The rich man also died and was buried. 
And he went to the place of the dead. I believe the King James would call that Hades. There in torment, he saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. The rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water and to cool my tongue. I'm in anguish in these flames. Verse 25, but Abraham said to him, son, remember that during your lifetime, you had everything you wanted and Lazarus had nothing. So now he is here being comforted and you are in anguish. And besides, there is a great chasm separating us. No one can cross over to you from here, and no one can cross over to us from there. Then the rich man said, Please, Father Abraham, at least send him to my father's home. For I have five brothers, and I want him to warn them so that they don't end up in the place of torments. But Abraham said, Moses and the prophets have warned them. Your brothers can read what they wrote. The rich man replied, no, no, Father Abraham, but if someone is sent to them from the dead, they will repent of their sins and turn to God. Look at verse 31. We'll conclude here. But Abraham said, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. What is he saying? Most often, the miraculous doesn't satisfy. Trust in what you have. Trust in what's been given to you. Even though we long for the spectacular, what I would claim is the irrefutable proof, God says in his word, God says that if we won't hear Moses and the prophets, if we won't hear the recorded, the written word of God, if we won't hear the testimonies of the people around us, then we will not believe even if we have a spectacular experience. Wow. So why do we long? I want you to see another one. That secondhand reports are enough. We're not convinced of it, but I want you to see secondhand reports are enough. Go to the Gospel of John, the 20th chapter. I apologize once again. You're not going to find this behind me. This would be a good time for me to say what I always say. How many have your Bible today? Lift it up. I haven't said this in over a month. Let me say it again. If you have your Bible, lift it up. Or if you have your Bible on a device, some of you your phone, it's okay. Don't feel, don't feel ashamed. I've got it everywhere. It's okay. I just want to always have God's word with me. Brendan, why, why is he asking this? Here's why. You wouldn't go play basketball without a basketball. You wouldn't go play football without a football. Why would you go to church without your Bible? Do we not come to church to learn from God's word? So I try to help you out, put some scripture up there for you, but hopefully you have it. So if I forget to get it to the team, you have it there in front of you. You can follow where I'm at. You can play with me this morning. So here in, in, in John chapter 20, this is after the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? And, and Jesus begins to show himself, begins to appear to different groups of people. And one of the groups of people that Jesus appears to is 10 of the 12 disciples. Why do I say 10? Because we know Judas isn't there. Judas, Judas did and went and did what he did, but there was another disciple that was not there. Thomas. He missed the disappearing of Jesus to the disciples. And the disciples come and report this to Thomas. I want you to see it. One of the 12 disciples, verse 24 of John 20. Thomas was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands. Put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he looks at Thomas and begins to speak to Thomas. 
Put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer, he says, believe. Thomas is so moved by this. He cries out, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus, looking at Thomas, makes this statement. Catch it. You believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing. Wow. Wow. Thomas would be satisfied with nothing less than a firsthand experience. For some reason, the report of his fellow believers, the fellow disciples, was not enough. Uh, I don't know about you, but this is pretty amazing to me because he has all the prophetic words. They're written down. He has them. He knows about Ezekiel. He knows about Daniel. He knows about Jeremiah. He knows about Isaiah. He's now walked with Jesus. He's seen all the miracles upon miracles upon miracles, the the blind seeing, the deaf hearing, those, the thousands who are hungry, being fed with a, a cup of fish and a few loaves of bread. He sees all of this. He knows what Jesus is capable of doing. But for some reason, he misses the appearing of Jesus. And knowing all of this, the testimony of his friends is not enough. And he has this encounter with Jesus. Jesus simply says, you believe only because you have seen. But blessed are those who believe without seeing. In essence, blessed are those who believe even with secondhand knowledge, secondhand experience. Come on, church, isn't that exactly who we are? Right? I, I might be crazy. I don't know. I, I would be of the opinion that most of us have not physically seen Jesus. I, I would be of the opinion that most of us probably have not, as we're walking down the road, seen some bright lights. Yet by faith, we're here today. By faith, we're here. We're following after Jesus. Even in the Old Testament, the people fear to go before God. And so they asked Moses to go on their behalf. God God gave the commands to Moses, and then it was Moses who was to relate the commands to the rest of the children of Israel. And thankfully, many of them believed Many of them, how do we know they believe? They, they chose to walk in obedience to the report. Even though they didn't get it firsthand, they got it through Moses. They, they, they were willing to accept it. I, I would submit to you this morning that, that we are not without help. We, we have help in, in our experiences with Jesus Christ. We have help in understanding God's word. We have, have help in the illumination of God's word. Where, where does the help come from? I would submit to you, it comes through the person of the Holy Spirit. Jesus has gifted us, each one of us, the person of the Holy Spirit, not not just to speak to us so that we can hear the words, but even for non-believers to be able to recognize the voice of God. John 16, Jesus declares that the Holy Spirit, talking about non-believers, will convict the world of guilt in regards to sin and righteousness and judgment. This, I submit to you, this is the work of the Holy Spirit for those who do not yet know Christ. I'll add to this, this is not my work. This is not your work. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. He can do this. How how do I know he can do this? Because I'm here. 
He can do this. I know because you're here. It's not my job. It's not your job to bring the conviction of the Holy Spirit. We just testify. We just proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ and let the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit can do. But hear me, he doesn't just speak to non-believers. He speaks to me and you, right? What does he do? John 14, verse 26. Jesus declared, the Holy Spirit will teach us all things and cause us to understand all that he has said. The Holy Spirit helps us to understand God's truth, to know God's word, to remember God's word. So as I begin to draw this to a conclusion for us this morning, here's what I want to submit to you. When God speaks to you and me, speaks to us, however, through whomever, may our desire be to obey it, to obey it, to obey it. Hebrews 3 is a great writing written. Verse 1 tells us who it's written to, the holy brothers who share in the heavenly call, so we believe that this was written to the to the believers. Uh, I know in today's world, we would want to call them Christians, but I would submit to you, even in Scripture, not all believers are called Christians. Sometimes we cheapen who Christians are. Christians are those who identify the life and model the life of Jesus. I'll, I'll throw a side note out to I, I think statistics get messed up because we think everybody in church is a Christian. Did Pastor just say that? I think I did. Statistics get really messed up. Because why would I say that? Because even in the Bible, not all believers were called Christians. So why would we differ from that today? Because most of the Bible in the New Testament was written to a group of believers, a church. But not all of them were called Christians. So we got to be careful of who we identify as Christians, even in today's world. But Hebrews was written to these believers. And picking up in verse 7, it says, So as the Holy Spirit says, here's the Holy Spirit helping us. Today, if you hear his voice... Do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the deserts. And he continues, if you jump down to verse 12, see to it that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Let's go back to the garden because that's where we're at today. Eve had God's word. May have been secondhand experience. We're not really quite sure, but she had it. We know Adam had firsthand experience. Either way, she had the responsibility to obey the command of God. And I've made mention of this every week, and I'm going to do it again today. She wasn't by herself. There was somebody else with her. Happened to be her husband, Adam. For whatever reason, Adam doesn't jump into this conversation. He leaves it up to his wife. And she becomes enticed and takes a hold of the fruit and bites it. And amazingly, everything still seems good. Right? Until he gives the fruit to his, her husband, Adam, and he takes a bite, and everything changes. Since then both of their eyes were open. They felt shame. They realized they made a mistake. Can I speak to the fathers, the husbands, for just a moment today? This is a premarital counseling, but if you go through premarital counseling with me, you'll get this. Both of you would get this. Go back to creation one more time. We read it. 
But when Eve was created, where was she created from? Right here. She wasn't created from his foot that Adam might trample over top of her. She wasn't created from his head that she would lord over him. She was created right here from his side that she would stand next to him. But catch this. Look where the rib is. It's underneath the covering of the wing. Right? Husbands, you have the responsibility to cover your family, to cover your wife. I don't know why it's quiet in here this morning. You have the responsibility to cover your wife, to cover. If Adam, if Adam would have stepped up, he's standing right there. If he just stepped up and told the serpent, no, no, we're not having any of this. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. You can take that garbage down the road a little bit further. But for some reason, Adam doesn't step up. He lets his wife take the, take the, the forbidden fruit and bite into it. He still has a chance. He could have thrown it on the ground and just squashed it. Did away with it. But he doesn't. He bites into it. And everything changes. Why? Because Eve was responsible. But Adam had a greater responsibility as the one to provide covering for the one that God had blessed him with. Husbands, hear me. Provide that spiritual covering Wives, catch me. Trust the spiritual covering of your husband. If your husband says, I don't think this is good, trust him. God has placed him there as a covering for your life. If you're not married and you have a a father. You know, my girls have heard this. Some of you have heard this. Man, I, I... I hate to say this. I feel sorry for when the guy comes to talk to me. It's a lot more than just putting a ring on her finger. Because before I bless this, he's going to know what his responsibility is. I've walked with this responsibility. And God, God, if God brings somebody else, he's got to know what that response, he's got to know what he's stepping up to, right? We, We need to know that. We need to teach this to our children. Just like you, I've, I've prayed a lot of things out of my family. I've prayed a lot of things out of my life. I've prayed a lot of things out of my family's life. Why? Because God has given me that responsibility. It's not that my wife doesn't stand with me in prayer, because she does stand with me in prayer. But, but God, hear me, we're not all created equal. I know we live in this world. We want to think everybody's equal. That, that's just a lie from the enemy. Does God love us equally the same? Sure, God does. Just go to the parable of talents. God gave one, one. God gave two, two. God gave another one, five. I don't know about you, but when I was in math, one, two, and five are not equal. But God saw something and gave them that responsibility. We have to be responsible for what we can be responsible for. Eve, Eve was going to be accountable for her actions. Just as Eve, we have to be accountable for, for our actions. God has blessed us with his word. Now hear me, don't, don't miss this. I'm not praying and believing against firsthand experiences because we all have But the reality is, God's word should be enough. His word, that the Holy Spirit will illuminate to us every day, Jesus says, should be enough. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And then he's blessed us with his Holy Spirit. Then he declares, Jesus, that is in Luke 11, verse 28, once again, blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. 
Hopefully, we will be found among those who do not have to have a miraculous bright light experience for us to be satisfied with God's word that's already available to us. From the standpoint of obedience to that word, the signals, here we are all the way back to the beginning, the signals we send must be certain about our faith and our commitment to God. So I ask you as I conclude this today, what signals are you giving off? Are you giving off signals of faith? Trust? Commitment? Or are we giving off weak spiritual signals? What kind of signals? Because I believe the enemy sees those signals. Let me make it personal. Am I going to be an easy target for the enemy? Or am I going to be a challenging target for the enemy? Because we're all going to be targets. Because we're all going to be tempted. The enemy is going to battle against all of us. But what kind of a target am I going to be? I'm, I'm praying that the enemy sees our faith. He doesn't just hear us talk about our faith. I'm praying the enemy sees our faith. When he looks into our eyes, he sees eyes of faith. He sees eyes of courage. He sees eyes of commitments. That, that's what I'm praying that the enemy sees when he looks at us. Not saying that he won't challenge us because, hear me, I've been challenged time and time and time again and I'm, I'm victorious not, not because of how I, I'm somebody great I'm, I'm victorious because of Jesus Christ. I, I'm overcomer through the blood of Jesus and the revelation says the word of my testimony the things that I proclaim I, I don't want to gripe to God. I don't want to complain to God. I, I want to be real with God. God I, I have this circumstance. I'm not going to complain because I know that you're bigger than this circumstance. I know you're the healer of this circumstance. I know that you're the deliverer of this circumstance. Hear me, what, what signals am I giving out? May my life not be a life of doubts. May it just be a life of faith. We always ask the question, not really why Eve, we ask why me? Well, what signals are you giving? Could explain why it's you? Uh, I mean, isn't that how the natural world works? The hunter doesn't go after the strongest in the flock. It goes after the weakest in the flock. Now, they'll challenge strong ones also but they're more apt to take down the weak ones. And I think many times the enemy looks out over the church and says, where's the weak one? But may the Lord strengthen us. He says, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and very courageous. Because he's with us. He's with us. Would you stand to your feet with me this morning, church? Hey, I just want to say thank you so much for making the choice of joining in with us uh, today. I just pray that this message was a benefit uh, into your life. Uh, and, and I just want to take a moment and pray with you. Uh, but before I pray with you, I also uh, just want to provide you the opportunity to uh, to know that your walk with the Lord is right. Uh, the Bible makes very clear to us that if we would believe in our, our heart that God did raise Jesus from the dead and that we would confess that Jesus is the Lord of our life, uh, we would be saved. That, that's why Jesus came, that's why Jesus went to the cross is so that we could be forgiven of our sins. And if you've never made that choice, I, I would just invite you uh, to make that choice today and, and I would love to pray with you and just pray that uh, the word today would be fulfilled in your life uh, and that we just grow together in our walk with Jesus Christ. So let, let's take a moment and pray together. Father, I just say thank you, Lord, for my friend, God, uh, 
their desire to know you, their desire to grow with you. Father, and I just, I trust that they're making that choice if they need to, to accept you as the savior of their life. God, and that uh, they're growing, God, maturing in their walk with you, Father. And I just, I pray that the word that was presented today, Lord, ministers to their heart, God, that that word is in an encouragement to them, God, and that we know that you are with us, that you are for us, God, and that you have great plans in store for each one of our lives. And I just trust that you would be honored, Lord, through our life of pursuit of wanting to know you, trusting that your will would be done. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. Thank you so much. May you have a blessed week this week.